Hello and welcome to a Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkash. The last time Europe saw millions of refugees flee across its borders was during the Second World War. But now that tragedy is playing out again. In the first five weeks of Russia's attack on Ukraine, nearly five million refugees fled westward, with Poland taking in the largest share. Inside Ukraine, countless people have been displaced. In response, the EU activated for the first time a policy created two decades ago called the Temporary Protection Directive. Intended to be used in exceptional circumstances, it allows for the immediate temporary protection for displaced people from outside the Union. Once in the EU, refugees fleeing Ukraine have rights to residency, access to the labour market, medical assistance and education. The swift move by European officials will allow millions of Ukrainians to receive immediate care, bypassing the EU's previous lengthy asylum process. But that has raised questions about whether this policy shift is an admission that previous actions towards refugees were a failure. And to discuss the EU's fast-changing refugee policy, I'm joined from Brussels by the European Director of the Norwegian Refugee Council, Eduard Rodier, and from Heidelberg, Germany, Achilles Skordas. He is a professor and senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for International Law. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk and thanks for joining me. Achilles, how, how would you assess Europe's handling of the refugees coming from Ukraine? I think that the European Union this time responded uh, quickly and effectively. Uh, already a few days after the beginning of the Russian invasion in Ukraine and after the first uh, migration flows had started, uh, the Union adopted uh, a legal instrument which is about uh, the implementation of the Temporary Protection Directive uh, in the case of uh, the Ukrainian uh, citizens. Uh, this is an act of 2001 yes. uh, directive and now we had the implementing decision for the first time that the temporary protection has been applied in the Union. So Edward, could you talk to us about this temporary protection directive? What does it offer? What exactly do refugees get under the TPD? It's What it provides first is the capacity to um, uh, to provide a, an immediate response at scale and on time, which is extremely difficult with, with existing, existing mechanisms. Um, we need to praise uh, the, the, the adoption of that mechanism that has allowed millions of people to uh, cross a border and seek for uh, protection. And, and this is really what the, the first thing that we need to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. I agree completely with Achilles. Uh, the, uh, um, it is a, a good response of the EU uh, that we have seen. We would like to see that more. So, but it gives uh, refugees fleeing Ukraine have rights to residency, access to labor market, medical assistance, uh, education, and so, uh, so on. Uh, but for how long? It's, uh, uh, it's for one year. It can be renewed for another year. Uh, my understanding is that um, it could go until three years if the condition doesn't improve. Um, again, it's uh, uh, compared, to, I mean, going through the classic uh, refugee status determination mm -hmm. is a long and heavy process that would have hampered and, and, and prevented many people from uh, seeking for uh, or accessing these services that you just mentioned um, in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. so, 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 no, it's good. It's so, really good. Achilles, the EU had adopted this directive following the uh, break of, uh, breakup of uh, Yugoslavia and its subsequent, uh, subsequent wars, but it was never implemented uh, until now. Why is that? Why wasn't this option um, activated in 2015 uh, during the Syrian crisis? Uh, yeah, there are a number of reasons uh, why it was not activated. It was indeed proposed uh, that it would be activated uh, during the Arab Spring and later into the 2015 crisis. However, one of the conditions is that the member states, uh, they cannot, the, the, their asylum system is overburdened and they cannot deal with asylum applications. The German government in 2015 considered that it can deal with the situation and mm -hmm. because 
the, about 1 million people, 800,000 or so, have entered Germany. The big bulk of, of the refugees, Germany said, I'll deal with that. We do not need to implement the temporary protection system. So, Edward, what are the possible uh, setbacks of this uh, policy? How useful and effective it'll be? For example, is there a clarity on how nations will implement this and which countries will host the Ukrainians and how will schools scope, for example? Yeah, the most important is that people can flee and that they can choose where to go and where they can continue their lives. This is what this... Uh, um, temporary protection directive allows to do. Uh, what is a bit unclear is um, uh, how that will articulate with existing mechanisms. The, the Pact on uh, Asylum and Migration that was recently adopted by the EU is meant to set a, a framework for mm -hmm. uh, uh, people coming from the outside. There is, of course, all the, the other mechanisms related to uh, refugee law, the Geneva Convention in particular. I mean, there are existing mechanisms. And I think we need to ask ourselves, why is that that we need to develop a new tool when, you, when, when we are being struck by, by a crisis of that magnitude? And just one additional element, let's keep in mind that we are looking at something very unprecedented. Yeah. In, in yeah. less than two months, Yes. 12 million yeah. people have been forced to flee. So, Achilles, could Europe's this extensive help to Ukrainians hamper the Union's other support packages and humanitarian aid uh, operations, let's say? I mean, does this current policy come at the cost of assistance to other countries in crises like Yemen, Syria, Afghanistan? Uh, the, the temporary protection system was created on the basis of the experience that we had in Yugoslavia. And the experience was that there were people who tried and succeeded and they were welcome uh, to come from neighboring states. That was the model. Uh, when the, the directive was adopted, everybody said, no, no, it's universal. We can apply to any situation. But it proved to be more appropriate to the situation of a regional crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's a difficulty to determine, for instance, which are the groups that are going to, to be protected. Uh, I assume that if, if, if there is a group of people coming from 10 nationalities and uh, you have determined the protection for Yemenis or for somebody else, yes. uh, then what are you doing? Uh, you return the others back or it, it's a problem for the system? So, um, Edouard, can we say this is kind of a wake-up call for Europeans to overhaul their refugee and asylum system or there is still some tangible risks, tangible risks that could it could end up um, repeating the failures of the 2015 crisis, which led to the rise of racism and right-wing movements across Europe. Look, um, it's a good mechanism. I mean, I represent a humanitarian and displacement agency, right? So if you look at the humanitarian standpoint, mm -hmm. there are millions of people who needed an immediate response this is, this is there, the, the, the directive provides this. From a refugee agency standpoint, uh, then, then we, we need to ask ourselves, um, how is it that we suddenly have a mechanism that allows only some people in need of protection, Ukrainians, national, or people who are living regularly in Ukraine, to flee inside Europe, while other people equally in need of protection, Afghans, Syrians, um, cannot. Um, or benefit from the same mechanism. Yes, so you, you, you draw a clear distinction here. So, but Achilles, could you also explain why Europe opens up to Ukrainians and closes down to other people from the other parts of the world? I mean, Edward kind of explained it, but what's your view on that? Yes, I will uh, give the easy answer and the difficult answer. The easy answer is that uh, it is a political and not a legal decision to grant temporary protection. Uh, so the union acts legally when it does as it does. Mm -hmm. However, the difficult answer is to say that in the case of Ukraine, we have a major geopolitical situation. It's not only about asylum and protection, it's about geopolitics of Europe. It's about the feeling that Europe now, the, the European community of, of nations is really a threat. And at that moment, you try to protect your home. It's mm -hmm. the instinctive feeling of 
of, of a continent suddenly under a mortal threat that needs to manage uh, the situation. And this is one of the reasons that uh, uh, this system has been applied now. So, Eduard, do you believe there is a need uh, for a collective approach towards uh, such humanitarian crisis across the world where, let's say, wealthier countries, maybe in the Gulf, should be helping out more? Yes, we need much more. We need much more uh, support from, from Gulf countries, from, from the rest of the world. Uh, Europe would not be enough. As well, coming back to one of the questions you asked before, uh, it is critical that there is additional efforts and that, and we've seen that, to respond to the Ukraine refugee crisis, but that these efforts do not harm the ability to support other people in need. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, the, the pot of money that exists to support people in need is limited. Um, there is an unprecedented crisis that we are witnessing now. We cannot allow the response to this crisis to harm other people in need. And it means more funding needs to be made available. It has been the case yeah. um, for the moment. Yeah. And, and, and we need to see more of that from Europe and from other countries. And, but Achilles, in the middle of the Ukraine crisis, the UK, which is no longer an EU member, has announced a controversial plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. Uh, what's your view on that? And could that set a precedent for other nations in the future? Uh, well, uh, this is a very interesting uh, case and very controversial what uh, the United Kingdom is doing. Uh, we have to see closely what are the rules of the Rwandan projects, whether they will stand the judicial scrutiny in the United Kingdom, and uh, uh, think whether it is workable at all. Uh, but we should uh, somehow uh, not easily say, oh, let them not go to Africa. Is there another sense of Africa being uh, a dark continent, not yeah. good for protection of people. We must be careful in analyzing the whole issue of the legality of this agreement with Rwanda. So, Edward, what's your take on that? How does it fit with international law and the UN Refugee Convention? Well, beyond the legality, I would like to say that, look, we are talking about people here. Uh, the, the baseline that everybody can understand is that it, any movement should be based on a voluntary basis. Uh, the, do these people want to go to Rwanda? Um, if yes, well, that's wonderful. Uh, if they don't, then we, we, we need to ask ourselves uh, who's making the decision. Is yeah. it people-centered or, or on what basis uh, are we uh, uh, considering uh, this? Uh, it is very important. Let These are vulnerable people, people who need to be listened to, and they will provide the answers that is the best for them. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.